Um, I also like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk about how to gauge time reversal symmetry, and also thank everyone for coming because I know this is a, this has been a long day, and I'll try to keep it short. All right, so this is uh, this is work done by me and Ashwin. Um, so we put this archive number here just in case you're interested. This is a good thing about making slides that I can have the archive number available. Um, so, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> okay. So, um, um, so gauging time reversal symmetry is something weird to talk about, maybe because because people talk about gauging, about ga uh, gauge theory, gauge field, whatsoever, and also people talk about time reversal symmetry. But, um, to my knowledge, these two parts are not put together very often. So today I'll be talking about how tensor network might be a platform to make sense of this weird concept. Okay, so I'll be, uh, so my talk will have three parts. I'll first talk about what is gauging time world, so what, what do I mean by that? And why do I want to do that? Because it's, uh, it's something um, not usually done in physics. It's something not, you, you can, you can, I, I cannot imagine go to a lab and gauge time also. And uh, thirdly, um, um, how do I uh, gauge time also symmetry using tensor network representation of many body quantum states? And actually, um, in the end of the talk, you might see that this is related to some um, common practice that has been used a lot in the study of matrix product states and sometimes higher dimensional generalizations of this. And um, I, I was surprised by that. <laughs> Okay, so first, uh, let me talk about what is what do I mean by gauging time reversal symmetry. Um, so people talk about gauging when, uh, a, so usually the context is that a system has certain symmetry, and um, if the system has certain symmetry, you can talk about coupling the system to a gauge field. And actually, the it's um, the simplest example. Everybody is very familiar with that. It's for example, we take a system with charge conservation symmetry, and the simplest one is just a conductor, an electric wire where the electrons in the in the wire and the number the number is conserved, and we can couple this wire to an electric magnetic field. And the electric magnetic field is the corresponding gauge field for the symmetry of charge conservation. So what we can do is that uh, sorry, we can uh, couple the wire to a battery and add a voltage across <coughs> it and uh, make a current. Or we can make a, a loop ring, a ring loop, out of this wire, and put some magnetic fields through the through the loop. So this is coupling um, a conducting wire to electric and the magnetic field. So this is very simple, and we do it every day. And um, so the gauging I'm going to talk about today is more in this sense. That is, we make some kind of loop, and we, we put some uh, flux through the through the loop. Okay, the second word in the title is time reversal. What is time reversal? Time reversal is reversing time, but you actually, so mathematically it means that uh, you take t and put it to minus t. But actually in, in physics, in real world, we never reverse time, so it's more of a, a theoretical formulation, but um, there are many quantities that are affected by this time reversal operation. For example, uh, there are certain quantities that are preserved, like the position of a particle or the mass or the charge or, uh, the electric field generated by a certain charge configuration. But there are also other physical quantities that are reversed by this operation of uh, reversing time reversal. For example, momentum, um, it, the particle going that way will be going backward, and also current. And uh, spin, spin is um, uh, formed by a current loop. So if a current is reversed, the spin is also reversed. And uh, related to that, the magnetic field generated by uh, the current or the spin. So, so we have many um, simple examples of uh, condensed matter systems where time reversal is either breaking or it's uh, time reversal invariant. For example, we can have a ferromagnet which has a net uh, magnetization, and because the magnetization is, reserved, uh, is reversed by this time reversal operation, we say that uh, this ferromagnet will break time reversal symmetry. And we can also have time reversal invariant system, and a paramagnet would be a time reversal invariant system, but in recent years, people have discovered more interesting ways to preserve time reversal symmetry in a condensed matter system. For example, this uh, topological insulator, where you have um, 
reactions going uh, uh, this way and that way, but also electrons carry spins, so the spins can point up and point down. So momentum and spin, they are both reversed on the time reversal symmetry, but because, for example, in this branch, in this blue branch, the, the electrons are coming towards us with spins pointing up, and the time reversal partner will be electrons going away from us with spins pointing down, so the electrons come in time reversal partners, and therefore the whole system is a uh, time reversal invariant. And this is actually a very non-trivial way for a condensed matter system to be time reversal invariant. It has created uh, a lot of, and it's, uh, it's called topological, and has created a lot of excitement in the community. So, uh, so, so I've talked about what is gauging, uh, what is time reversal. So what does it mean to put these two things together? For example, um, can we do something similar to putting a flux through a, a conductor ring? For example, if we have a time reversal invariant one-dimensional system, can we make a ring out of it and put a time reversal flux through it? Or we can imagine that uh, if we have a two-dimensional system, like a topological insulator uh, that I showed on the previous slide, which, has, which is also time reversal invariant, and uh, what does it mean to put a time reversal flux through the little hole in the middle of the two-dimensional sample? So usually people don't talk about gauging time reversal. <coughs> what has been talked about more uh, um, frequently in the literature is gauging uh, the charge conservation symmetry as has been talking about by coupling to the uh, electric magnetic field. So uh, by the way, charge conservation, uh, we also call it a U1 symmetry because the symmetry is, uh, the action of the symmetry is to take add a phase factor of e to the i theta and E, and E is the total number of electrons in the system. So this whole group of operations form a U1 group, so that's why we call this charge conservation a U1 symmetry. So if this <coughs> total number of charge is conserved, then the system uh, <coughs> is invariant under this symmetry operation and only can change by a total phase factor. So for, you, uh, for charge conservation symmetry, uh, you couple it to an uh, electric magnetic field. Oh, sorry. Uh, this has been done in everyday life, and uh, also people talk about gauging more non-trivial kind of groups like SU2 or SO3. Uh, these are being studied very uh, uh, popularly in, in a high energy standard model. But what does it mean to gauge time reversal? And as I'll show you that, these, uh, that I can, <coughs> this, this concept actually makes sense in terms of tensor product states. But but first I need to tell you why I, why I want to do this. So you may have a <coughs> good reason to couple a conductor to electromagnetic field, or you can say I have a good reason to study uh, SU2, SO3 gauge theory for uh, high energy <coughs> theories, but why do I want to gauge time reversal symmetry? So for me, there's um, a very simple reason, because gauging um, turns out to be a very useful probe of the physical properties of the condensed matter system I have. For example, if I have a conductor, uh, the first thing we learn in middle school or even uh, younger is that we couple it to a, a charge or a magnetic field and measure the conductance or the magnetic susceptibility of the system. That tells me a lot about the property of the inner working of the system. But moreover, um, gauging symmetry has turned out to be a very useful probe for topological order, and that's the thing I'm going to focus on because I'll be studying a uh, gap system. So unlike what Xiaoliang has been talking about, the, the system I'm going to be focusing on have an energy gap, but they have some kind of topological order, meaning that they have non-trivial properties that is not like a, a simple product state. They have, been, they have to be described by a very, a very entangled quantum ground state. So, Gauging turns out to be a very uh, useful probe of topological order, and I'll give you some examples of that. For example, uh, the first known system with topological order, apart from superconductor, <laughs> is this uh, quantum Hall system, where it's a two-dimensional electron gas. Electrons move in a two-dimensional system. And what's realized, uh, I forgot to put reference here, but it was found in the 1980s by, uh, that if we add a voltage potential, a uh, voltage drop across the x direction and measure the current flow in y direction, you can see these exactly quantized plateaus of the conductance in the system. So this is called uh, the Hall conductance 
um, the quantum Hall effect in a two-dimensional electron gas. And um, so, and this uh, hot conductance, is, hot conductance is usually denoted by uh, sigma x y. Um, so, in this quantum Hall system, it turns out that <coughs> spreading flux can be a very effective way of measuring this hot conductance instead of just um, um, putting a voltage drop and measuring a current in the other direction, what we can do is to thread a ma magnetic flux through the system. So this is a, this is a insulator, and the, the charge is conserved in the system, so it has a U1 charge conservation symmetry. And we can thre thread a ma magnetic flux of magnitude, say, uh, phi. And what we will find is that during this process of threading a flux, we have accumulated some charge around this flux. And this charge is exactly sigma xy times this flux phi. So by threading a flux, we can measure this important topological quantity uh, in the quantum Hall system, which tells us um, the basic feature of this uh, topological system. OK, so uh, we can also imagine that uh, we can break down this U1 symmetry to something uh, smaller. For example, in a superconductor, a super, in a superconductor, the uh, number of, total number of charges is no longer conserved. So um, the superconductor doesn't have a U1 symmetry, but instead it has a Z2 symmetry because it's a fer fermionic system, and the parity of the fermions still have to be conserved. So it either has uh, even number of fermions or it has no odd number of fermions. So the U1 symmetry is broken down to a Z2 symmetry. And because of this breaking down of this continuous group to this uh, discrete group, uh, we know that superconductor has the so-called Meissner effect that we cannot thread just any um, value of magnetic flux through the system because it will be expelled. But instead, we can uh, create a finite, a finite energy um, um, magnetic flux through the system, which is quantized to this value of h over 2e. So. Um, so if you have a two-dimensional superconductor, we can put the magnetic flux of h over 2e uh, through the system. And what we will find is that uh, if the system is topological, there are certain non-trivial things going on. For example, if the uh, system is a P-wave superconductor, meaning that the pairing is uh, symmetric, then um, um, what happens when we thread such a flux through the system is that at this point of flux threading, you will find a zero, a uh, Mahron zero mode. So, um, so this is pr uh, discovered by uh, Reed and Green in 2000, in 2000, and has been a very effective way of detect, uh, creating a Mahuang mode. So uh, more recently, there has been more work because there have been uh, a lot of more topological phases found, and the uh, gauging symmetry has becoming a very popular way to um, identify or to distinguish these phases. For example, in um, uh, f the first paper was, uh, 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 well, Levin and Gu proposed in that in two-dimensional bosonic Z2 SP uh, symmetry protected topological phases, that gauging this Z2 symmetry um, can provide a way to distinguish trivial and non-trivial topological phases. And uh, similarly, there are many other um, uh, proposals about gauging uh, symmetry in 2D. Also, we can consider gauging symmetry in 3D. For example, in this... Um, a work by Xiaoliang uh, on topological insulator, we can couple fermionic topological insulator to electric magnetic field because it's an insulator, it conserves charge. And what we find is that um, this, uh, 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 <coughs> this um, a theta term in the low energy description of top fermionic topological insulators. And furthermore, it has been proposed that something similar but different happens in the bosonic topological insulator, which is proposed by uh, Matlitsky, King, and Fisher. Uh, with something called a uh, uh, statistical Witten effect. So I'm not going to go into details about this, but just to point out that gauging symmetry has been a very effective way, at least theoretically, to identify phases with topological order and to <coughs> distinguish them. And this also um, applies to system what we, uh, topological order called the symmetry enriched topological order, meaning that the system has some uh, quasi-particle uh, excitations, and on top of that, we have extra symmetry enrichment of this uh, of this of this topological order. So, um, so naturally, um, one might consider whether all this applies to system with time reversal symmetry, because 
when we studied all these sym uh, symmetry protected topological order, symmetry enriched topological order, time reversal is naturally included in our study. And we have found a lot of um, system which are non-trivial protected or enriched by, by, by time reversal symmetry. For example, in, this, in one dimension, it was realized that uh, uh, if you have a spin one chain of, uh, if you have a chain of spin one, and they interact in this way, then the ground state has some, has the one dimensional symmetry protected topological order protected by time reversal. Basically, uh, the one dimensional chain, on the edge of the one dimensional chain, there's a spin one half, and the spin one half transform on the time reversal in a very different way uh, from integer spins. Basically, a spin one half transforms as t squared equal to minus one instead of t squared equal to plus one for integer spins. So this AKLT chain, even though it's made of spin ones, uh, the effective edge degree of freedom transform as a fractional of that underlying degree of freedom. So it's uh, some, something, uh, it has the symmetry protected topological order and it's protected by time reversal symmetry. And also in uh, higher than 1D, we have found a lot of uh, more examples beyond this AKLT state. For example, this uh, topological insulator example I was talking about. So can we, for all these uh, time reversal symmetry protected and time reversal enriched topological order, can we potentially define something called gauging time reversal and um, use them to identify or distinguish topological orders like this? Well, this may not be uh, a very uh, physical way because I don't know what is a uh, time reversal gauge field in, in the lab, but at least I can imagine that numerically we may be able to um, do something. So now comes the third question. So exactly um, what do I need to do? How can I gauge time reversal symmetry? Well, um, suppose that we have a system which is, well, I'll, I'll, I'll suppose that the system is gap. Suppose we have a gap system which is time reversal invariant. What exactly do we have to do to couple the system to, a say, a time reversal flux? Well, in order to answer this question, we need to go back and think more carefully about what exactly we did to couple, say, a, a conductor to a magnetic flux. And if we can say clearly what we did in that case, maybe it can help us think what we need to do here. So imagine that we have a one-dimensional ring where an electron can uh, hop on the ring. Um, there's a famous effect proposed by Aharonov and Bohm that if you have an electron hopping on the ring and if you uh, put a magnetic flux through it, then what happens is that the wave function have a twisted boundary condition. Basically, if the flux is zero, the wave function should be periodic, meaning that uh, the, the wave function at <coughs> L should be uh, the same as the wave function at zero. So, so the L is the total length of the ring. But however, if we have a non-zero flux through the ring, then uh, the wave function at L would be different from the, the wave function at uh, point zero by a phase factor of e to the i e phi over h bar. Here, e, th this e is the uh, electric charge. So putting a flux through a conductor ring amounts to twisting the boundary condition of a quantum mechanical system. So this is... Um, uh, so that, that was a single particle formulation of this aharonov bohm effect. But, uh, so here we are considering many-body systems, so we need, a, we need a second condensation. We better put it into a many-body formulation. So let's describe electrons hopping on a ring with a, a lattice model where the, well, just like Xiaoliang, what Xiaoliang wrote down, electron hopping in this one-dimensional system. So C1 dagger C2, C2 dagger C3, et cetera. So if there's no flux, this is the Hamiltonian of my system uh, with, with some chemical potential, which I uh, forgot to add. And uh, it's easy to see that this Hamiltonian is invariant under global charge conservation symmetry, under global U1 symmetry. So this symmetry, global symmetry is e to the i theta, uh, n total. n total is the total number of charge in the system, and theta is arbitrary phase factor from uh, 0 to 2 pi. And obviously, this uh, total Hamiltonian is invariant under this global symmetry, basically because this 
global symmetry, you can break it up into actions on different lattice site. So the total um, number of electrons in the system is a summation over number of electrons at different lattice sites. So each lattice, on each lattice site, <coughs> the symmetry operation breaks up into e to the i theta and k, where n k is the number of electrons on that site. So the total, uh, so, so the global symmetry breaks up into local pieces, and and the c dagger and c operator transforms under these uh, local operations. Basically, a c dagger transforms under this uh, local operation by gaining a phase factor of e to the i theta, and the c operator transforms by losing a phase factor of e to the i theta. And by putting them together, we see that the whole Hamiltonian is uh, charge conservation, uh, charge conserved. Okay, why I go into so much detail about this obvious uh, symmetry conservation? Because once I put a flux through the ring, then what happens is that I change the Hamiltonian by just one term on the boundary. So I, take, I pick up this term, this Cn, C1 term. This is on the boundary. And I add a phase factor in front of it, e to the i phi. So this phi is just the, the flux I put through the ring. And you can see that this change in the Hamiltonian can be generated by applying a local symmetry transformation on this boundary term. So this, so this is no longer the global symmetry transformation. If I apply the global symmetry transformation on this boundary term, this term would still be invariant, so nothing would happen. But however, I only twist the, the Hamiltonian on one side of the boundary. So I only apply symmetry on site n, but not on site 1. And by doing that, uh, this, um, and I, I apply the symmetry operation corresponding to the flux that I thread through the, through the ring. By doing that, this boundary term will gain a phase factor of e to the i phi. And this is exactly uh, what is done in order to um, uh, couple this one-dimensional ring um, to a, a magnetic flux. So we can see that in order to couple a system with U1 charge conservation symmetry to a U1 flux, what we need is to, we need two steps. First of all, we need a local action of symmetry. Uh, remember that we broke down this global action of U1 into local action of uh, phase factors for each site. And the second step is to take the boundary, take the boundary and twist the boundary by applying the symmetry only on one side of the boundary, but not on the other side. Doesn't, doesn't this operation also change the C n minus one dagger C n term? C1, sorry, C1 minus. Well, but that's exactly what she's saying now. Well, I don't know exactly how you're defining this operation. Uh, sorry, I missed your question. Are you Can applying you... an operation on site N? Is that, the, is that all you're doing? Yes. But that also affects other terms in the Hamiltonian. Yeah, exactly. So um, I'm not saying that I'm applying this operator to the whole Hamiltonian. I'm just taking the boundary term, applying the Hamiltonian to the boundary term, just twisting the boundary term. Yeah, all the other terms remain variant. So it's not a unitary transformation? It's not a unitary on the Hamiltonian. If I, yeah. So, it, uh, aw so the point is that away from the boundary, it seems that nothing has happened. But just at the boundary, it looks like I have applied the symmetry to half of the system. And that's a very uh, important point that I will come back to uh, later. All right, so, um, so this is what we did for uh, U1. Uh, charge conservation symmetry. So the question becomes, can we do something similar for time reversal? So uh, obviously we need, to, we need to satisfy the two conditions. First of all, we need a local action of time reversal symmetry. Uh, can we um, decompose time reversal also into something like T1 cross T2 cross T, uh, Tn, like that? And second of all, we need, if we find this local action of symmetry, we need to say, how do we, need to, uh, how do we uh, add a symmetry twist? corresponding to time reversal symmetry operation through, say, a one-dimensional ring or a two-dimensional system. And thirdly, if, uh, after adding this symmetry twist, how can we probe the time reversal symmetry-related topological order? So that's the three steps I'm going to uh, talk about. OK, so it turns out there is a reason that uh, why time reversal symmetry is not gauged so often. like. U1 or SU2 or Z2 symmetries because it's very different from all the other symmetries. It's anti-unitary. So this is, uh, Wigner first proposed that time reversal symmetry has the, this weird 
property that if it acts on i, which is a number, it changes into minus i. So this is something fundamental on this um, quantum mechanical nature, uh, this, this complex nature of quantum mechanics. And, um, and it doesn't <coughs> happen for all the other symmetries that I've been talking about, like u1, z2, su2. They are all unitary symmetries. But time reversal is anti-unitary, and that's, that, that makes all the difference. So the global symmetry action of time reversal on a condensed matter system um, has this complex conjugation part. So this k refers to complex conjugation. Apart from that, it can also have unitary transformations. And that's fine. But it's a composition of two parts, unitary transformation and complex conjugation. For example, on spin 1 half, on time, this unitary transformation is i sigma y. And what it does is to map 0 to 1, 1 to minus 0. That's all fine, because it means that I flip the spin from up to down, down to up. But once you have a superposition of 0 and 1 state, for example, alpha 0 plus beta 1, and apply time reversal symmetry, what happens is that you need to take complex conjugation of the coefficient also, not just to uh, map the, the basis state. So this is a fundamental difference between time reversal symmetry and unitary symmetries. So this, um, this unitary transformation of I, say, I sigma Y is very similar to what we saw in, for unitary symmetries, and they are uh, and they, their action are decomposed onto each lattice side, onto each spin one half. But however, this complex conjugation looks like a very big operation. You take a wave function, or you take the Hamiltonian, and you apply the complex conjugation altogether. How can we define a local action of complex conjugation? Um, so there's a very simple case where you, you say, oh, I, uh, there's a very naive way to apply complex conjugation because for example, uh, let's consider a product state, the simplest many-body wave function that you can have um, of this form, where it's a pr product of each spin 1 half. And you can just say that complex conjugation on spin 1 is just taking complex conjugation on this product wave function of spin 1. I'm just taking complex conjugation on this alpha and beta, but not all the other alpha and betas. Okay? So for product state, the problem is solved. But what about entangled state? Because for entangled state, we have this big superposition. We have all the basis state i1 through in, and the coefficient is a big number. How can we say what does it mean to just partial, to complex conjugate it on site 1, but not on site n? Well, you may have guessed the answer because I advertise it. It's uh, using the tensor product representation. It turns out that the um, tensor product representation gives us a way to break up this big coefficient in a many-body wave function into local pieces. So this is the, <coughs> this is the matrix product state, and this is uh, a two-dimensional uh, tensor product state. In a matrix product state, this big coefficient is written as the trace over a bunch of matrices. So this is uh, usually what I draw and as a matrix product state, where these are vertical lines are the physical indices, and the horizontal lines are in the indices for the matrices which are uh, contracted all together. So, um, so, these, uh, so in two dimension, we don't have a matrix product state anymore. We have tensor product states where the, the in the indices can go horizontal and vertical, and there are, uh, there are physical uh, indices pointing out of the plane. And because of this breaking up of this big coefficient of wave function into local pieces, we can now have a meaningful way to define what is a local action of complex conjugation. Basically, we take this um, complex conjugation of matrices on site 1, or the tensor on site 1, and that, give, uh, that, that, uh, that can be defined just as local action of complex conjugation. Now, this may sound very uh, simple and uh, <coughs> natural to do for people working on matrix product states and tensor product states. Um, but <clears throat> and I'll show that this actually uh, is very useful as a, as a probe for topological order. So there is a problem with this, because 
So there could be many different representations. Mm -hmm. So the yes. representation yes. is not written exactly. in stone, right? Yes, yes. So Exactly. Yeah. So uh, unlike product states, these uh, matrices or tensors, they're not unique. So this complex conjugation may involve some, uh, uh, so they, they may depend on the choice of gauge. The choice of exactly. So the point uh, we are trying to, so in the examples that we are trying to show is that the way we use this um, um, local definition of time reversal and the threading flux procedure to Identify topological order will be independent of this gauge choice. So that's a basic requirement of what, what we do. So OK, this gives a, a local definition of complex <coughs> conjugation. And, um, and very naturally, the lo local definition of time also follows by just um, um, applying whatever unitary that has to be done to, say, the first spin, whether you need to flip the spin or do whatever. That's totally fine. OK, so we solved the first problem. We have a local definition of symmetry on tensor product states. And secondly, we need to uh, talk about how to add a symmetry twist corresponding to threading a time reversal flux through a one-dimensional ring. So this is related to some very nice properties of matrix product states and tensor product states under symmetry transformation. So <clears throat> it was realized in this 2008 paper uh, by people sitting in the audience that um, matrix product states have a uh, transform on the symmetry in a very special way. So basically, if, a, if we have a matrix product states, which is um, symmetric under this symmetry transformation, where the symmetry is applied as U on each side, then the, matri then the matrix is representing the state doesn't have to be invariant under this symmetry. Instead, it only has to be invariant up to some gauge transformation M and M inverse on each side. And this is because once we put all these matrices together and into a, a many body wave function, we can see that these, uh, these gauge transformations, they cancel with each other. So the, the M from the first side cancel with the, uh, sorry, the M inverse from the first side cancel with the M from the second side and so on and so forth. And we take the periodic boundary condition, everything's gone. So even though the representing tensors, they are not, they, they change under this symmetry action, the wave function they represent is still invariant. And this is actually, uh, the reverse direction is also proven that um, whenever we have a gapped uh, one-dimensional MPS that has the symmetry, then the, tens then the matrix product state representation, the matrix is representing the state will transform under symmetry like this by a M and M inverse gauge transformation. So, um, so OK, so um, because of this, we can see what happens when we act symmetry locally uh, in the, on a matrix product state. For example, if we act it uh, on two sides, then we can see that in the middle of the system, uh, these gauge transformations, in, in the middle of the segment where we apply the local symmetry, and the gauge transformation cancels, and only something on the boundary changes. So if we apply the, uh, the symmetry on a segment, you can see a domain wall here and a domain wall here, but inside and outside, everything looks, nothing happened. Okay. So, so if we ever want to do something like a symmetry twist, then that's like a single domain wall along a ring of the system then we can imagine that what happens is to insert just one of the operators into the one-dimensional chain. So if we have M here, M inverse there, that would correspond to two domain walls, but that would be a segment. If we want to just do a twist, we would just put one of the operators here, and not, a, not another one which, uh, which corresponds to the other end of the symmetry operator. So. So this, this sounds like a, uh, like a wave function way to define what, what it means to thread a flux. But previously, I talked about how to twist, how to do the twist on the Hamiltonian. So uh, are these two consistent? And actually, um, they are consistent if, if the ground state is gapped. So suppose that we have a one-dimensional Hamiltonian like this. And what I proposed to twist the Hamiltonian if I thread a flux corresponding to the symmetry U, is that I take the boundary term H and one, only the boundary term, 
and uh, apply the symmetry un and un inverse. Sorry, this is un inverse, not un minus 1. Um, so I apply the symmetry on uh, one side of the boundary. So you can see that um, what, hap what, what happens to the Hamiltonian is that away from the boundary, nothing changes. All the term remains the same. Um, but at the boundary, it looks like I have applied the symmetry transformation <coughs> on one side. So it doesn't matter if I write uh, U, un or un uh, tensor product with un minus 1, tensor product with un minus 2. I can take an even larger uh, symmetry transformation. That will give me the same effect. But the point is that at the symmetry, uh, at the boundary, sorry, at the boundary, it looks like I have done symmetry transformation only on one side. So this is what happens <coughs> to the Hamiltonian. And you can see that by inserting this operator into this one-dimensional MPS, it exactly corresponds to this gauge transformation on the Hamiltonian because away from the boundary, nothing happens. But at the boundary, it looks like I have applied symmetry on, say, this half line of the chain, but not the other. Uh, and the, you, you will never be able to find the other uh, domain wall. So, so uh, no, I don't know that. Oh, okay. So it, it that's a good it's question. Not, sorry, it's not it's not really tiny, but that was exactly. But like, I guess you could probably derive it from the MPS by looking at the green box and looking at the pattern or something like exactly. that. Exactly. So for time reversal, I need to make this connection because I define everything on top on, in terms of this uh, wave function. But it would be nice to have a formulation in terms of Hamiltonian. You can say that. Uh, why don't you just? Uh, uh, go back and see what happens to the Hamiltonian, you can have a corresponding definition. I don't find a very nice definition, but it would be good if, if someone comes up with an idea. So yeah. this picture don't work with time reversal? Uh, the, the, uh, this is how I define uh, what, is a, 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 what is threading a flux for time reversal for, for, for the wave function. Hamiltonian for the Hamiltonian, I don't have a very... Uh, really I don't know what it means. <laughs> It would be nice if I say take a Hamiltonian term, what it means to separate the coefficient into left and right part. You might say it's a matrix product operator. And I don't know. It doesn't seem to be very um, um, direct. Yeah, anyway. So um, so this, this, this correspondence happens for unitary symmetry. That's a very good point. Um, but, um, but of course, um, uh, this, this is generically true. This correspondence between Hamiltonian and ground state is generically true for gap ground state. If you, have a, if you don't have a gap ground state, this is not true. For example, in the one-dimensional conductor that Xiaoliang talked about or I talked about previously, it's not true that the wave function will have a phase accumulation around the ring. But um, for gap ground states, if you only twist the Hamiltonian along the boundary, then the wave function only changes at the boundary. And this is, uh, this is actually uh, proposed as a generic property for gap Hamiltonians in the paper by Bravi, Hastings, uh, Maclatis when they, when they try to prove the stability of topological order. Sorry, sorry what statement remains true? Uh, that, uh, okay, I'll state the statements. The statement is that for, there are certain class of uh, Hamiltonian, gap Hamiltonian, such that um, the ground state the reduced sensor matrix in the ground state is determined by homo local Hamiltonian terms in that region, but not affected by something far apart. So that's the t what they call the topological quantum order condition two in the paper. And um, um, so here, what it means is that if the Hamiltonian term doesn't change, I should expect the ground state reduced sensor matrix also doesn't change. But if the Hamiltonian changes like that, I should expect the ground state to change like that. So there's a correspondence between the change in the Hamiltonian and change in the in gapped ground state. Make sense? But, but I believe that it's an assumption that the gap stays oh. open while you uh, the perturbation. Uh, is what? Sorry? That the gap stays open is an assumption. The gap stays open? Yeah, it's not just a, a condition on before you perturb. It's not just a condition. Unless the perturbations are small, but if it's an, if it's one operation, oh, yeah, yeah. one operation, yeah, yeah, yeah. then you then anything you can happen. Really know yeah, what yeah. Has 
Uh, are you asking whether it's only for fixed point Hamiltonian or what? Why there's um, perturbation? So uh, the, the, the results of Bravi and Hastings and Nikolakis yes. refer to sufficiently small perturbations. And uh, this is and only in also, yeah. and the, the technique can also be used to prove that if you and, and then they prove the gap stays open. Yeah. You can also prove if the gap stays open, then yes. the perturbations only have local effects. Yeah. So but what I'm, I'm talking about is. It has nothing to do with the stability of gap. I'm just talking about some condition they put on the gap Hamiltonian before they prove the stability of the gap. Uh, this is just some property between. No, he's telling you that the gap existed before you applied U, but to apply U, you change Hamiltonian, so the gap can change or even close. That's what he's saying. Oh, okay, okay. But this is not uh, that's a good point, but I don't think it happens. I see. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I don't think it happens here. Uh, just changing one term will close the gap. Uh, I think you have proved that this uh, gap is uh, very small, other than we know. Because this U is a symmetry, so you can spread this twist in very length. Yeah, if that's a U1 twist, and if that's a Z2 twist. Yeah. 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 Right. Uh, is there an example that you add a twist and you close the gap? Um, I, I don't know. Well, <laughs> Thank you. Because the generalcy can certainly change. Uh, yeah, that's true. And that, that means that a gap, that's something that was unique. Those gaps and the gaps that can certainly cannot be gone to for the general. But in the previous That's transparency, it? you have a, we have two domain or nothing changes. Even when the two domain uh, were all yeah. separate. That's so, that's a unitary so transformation. But this yeah. is one domain also probably. Done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if this is a short range correlated, you would say, oh, okay, one domain. <laughs> Two, uh, so two domain words, just. Yeah, kind of yeah, I'll just do this. <laughs> 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 All right. Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. So, so this this shows the correspondence of definition of gauging on the Hamiltonian level and the ground state level for unitary symmetries. But I'll just take this definition for ground state, for wave functions, for time reversal symmetry, because there's no definition for Hamiltonian for time reversal symmetries. OK. So uh, it was pointed out in uh, okay. and just yes. while we're at this, can I ask? So changing the second component of the spin for one of the interaction terms by a minus sign would not serve your purpose? Consider the Hamiltonian method instead of the Heisenberg interaction. Yeah, I don't know whether that's a generic way to do it. Mm. It depends on what you want to do, right? What you want to see <laughs> from this operation. Well, you know best. <laughs> so, um, so my um, my impression is that for Hamiltonian, I didn't find a, a very good way to formulate this. Um, okay, so. <coughs> So it was pointed out in the paper by Frank Pullman and uh, other people in 2010 that um, similar properties hold for matrix product states under time reversal symmetry. So basically by taking complex conjugation and applying unitary, the unitary operation necessary, the MPS would change also by a gauge transformation like that if the MPS represented is time reversal symmetric. Uh, also, uh, there are many cases, I'll talk about examples, where in two dimension, we can imagine that uh, applying time reversal symmetry locally, basically taking complex contribution, applying unitary, would induce gauge transformations in, uh, in all four directions. M and M inverse in this direction, and N and inverse in that direction, so that they cancel out uh, when they are put together. Uh, stupid question, like in the AKT, what is M? Is that sigma Y or something yes. like that? Yes, yes. Okay. I think I have a slide later for that. I may, may have slides later for that. Maybe the next, next slide. Um, so uh, so f to, to put in a symmetry twist through a one-dimensional ring would be uh, insert M here. And to put a symmetry twist through a two-dimensional system, imagine that we have periodic boundary condition, and we want to put a, a flux along one of the non-trivial loop. 
then uh, what we need to do is to insert these operators along a non-trivial loop in the torus. OK, so we have finished the second step. And uh, so the third one would be to use this procedure to identify topological order related to time reversal symmetry. And uh, what we found is that this can come out of the composition rules of time reversal twist. But the composition rules have a, an adjective which is projective, meaning that while we would expect that composing two time reversal fluxes should give you nothing, because you do time reversal once, you do time reversal twice, you, you get back. But however, composing two time reversal fluxes sometimes don't give us the exact state, but only the state up to a phase factor. So that's how topological order may be identified. And this is actually a, this has actually been done for matrix product states for years, and uh, people know this and has been used a lot for uh, uh, classifying, say, a, matri uh, a symmetry protected topological order in 1D. But, but here I'm just reinterpreting it, reinterpreting the 1D procedure as gauging time reversal symmetry. And then I'll be generalizing this, what, we do, what we did for 1D to higher dimensions. So in 1D, it's known that um, this transformation holds for the uh, matrix product representation with, on the time reversal symmetry. And if we thread a flux, we have M. And then uh, if we thread another flux, uh, we can insert another M. But because this is time reversal symmetry, so somehow uh, we need to take the complex conjugation of the first M. And now we can talk about the composition of the two. So usually we would imagine that the two flux should uh, combine into nothing. But however, it's proven that uh, this um, M star M can be either plus one or minus one. And plus one, sorry, plus one corresponds to a trivial phase, and minus one corresponds to this non-trivial AKLT state, where the matrices are given by sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, and the, the time reversal symmetry is complex conjugation together with a, a spin flip. And uh, this M is I sigma y, which has this property of M star M equals minus 1. So that indicates what, what star is this complex conjugation? a complex conjugation, but sorry. I know that I complex conjugation would be 1. Yeah, but sigma y is also uh, But it's also like complex. conditional conjugation on sigma y? Yes, yes. A complex conjugation. I think Y is real. No, I think Y is real. So now, I think Y is real. So M star should be equal. Yeah. So, but you have sigma Y squared 1, but I squared minus 1. Yeah, but it's but this minus 1 is, uh, it doesn't depend on the phase of M. That's a good point. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry? M is just this matrix. It's uh, I times sigma y. It's a two by two matrix. Uh, you, uh, what do you mean? Sorry, anti-linear. Uh, your complex and the time oh, I see. I see. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, you can you can think of M actually as a, a anti-linear operator because that's why that's why we took complex conjugation of the first M when we composed that. So you can imagine they come they come with K. So M is not really high in the Yeah, yeah, you can put a K in here so that you don't have to put this star here. Yeah. With ordinary matrices, the equation is true, even though M star equals M, the equation is nonetheless correct. Yeah, and the point is that this, as uh, Nobel pointed out, this the total phase factor of this M is not meaningful because we also always have M and M inverse appearing pairs. So you can change the phase factor of M by whatever you like. And this, you can just put a sigma Y. But if you put sigma Y here, you can, you can still see that sigma Y star, sigma Y, is still minus 1 because sigma Y is complex. 
Okay. Okay. So this is the one-dimensional case, and uh, it's been well known in uh, in the matrix product state, uh, in the study of matrix product states, and we are trying to generalize all these understanding to higher dimensions and see how it can allow us to uh, identify and distinguish symmetry protected topological order or other topological order in two and higher dimensions. So we did a very simple example here, which is a uh, uh, SPT order with Z2 and time versal symmetry. So, um, so in 2D, if we only have time versal symmetry, there's, there are no um, SPT phases, so everything's trivial. So what we need to do is to uh, put time versal together with some other symmetry. So here we choose this Z2 symmetry, and, and there's a non-trivial phase here. And what happens is that if we create a Z2 symmetry flux in the system, it would transform as uh, a spin one half. It would transform as t squared equal to minus one. So you can imagine that what we propose to do is to thread time also fluxes through the through the non-trivial ring along one direction. For example, we can have one flux like that and another <coughs> one, and uh, we can allow them. We can uh, we can see how they compose and uh, try to see from that process if there is a projective phase factor coming out. But a Z two symmetry flux transform of t squared to the minus one. I mean, Z2 just a, this is unitary symmetry, right? Uh, yes, sorry. It's a, a Z2 uh, end of the flux defect line. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but we're not ending things here. But, yeah. um, okay, so... Um, oops. Uh, so if we, uh, if we just uh, allow them to combine like that, we don't see anything happening. This is basically consistent with the fact that if we only consider time reversal symmetry, the state is totally trivial, that nothing happens if it's just time reversal symmetry. And somehow we need to put in the fact that it's, a, it's a, the, the, the interaction between Z2 and time reversal that's non-trivial. So, so here we'll, you say that's so n times n star will be equal to 1 in this particular example. Uh, not necessarily 1, but, um, but the, the total action on the state will be trivial. But could be minus 1. You could have phase difference. Uh, well, if it's minus one, then two, uh, it's not minus one anyway. So it, the action on the inner indices may be non-trivial, but because here we don't have injective tensors, so the, the, at the end of the day, the, ground, the wave function is still the invariant. Not even a phase change. Not even, even change not, not a phase change. So what we need to do is to um, put a Z2 flux in this direction. And similarly, Z2 flux, what, what you need to insert here comes from the local Z2 symmetry action on each uh, lattice side. Uh, so we insert a Z2 flux in this direction and, um, and insert two time also fluxes in that direction. And then something happens, because now if we allow these two time also fluxes to annihilate with each other, we see a minus one phase factor. So this you can imagine that actually what we, we are doing is to <coughs> You can imagine taking the torus and cutting it open, and then we're inserting a Z2 flux in this direction, so we create two flux endpoints at the end, and that measures the T squared equal to minus one <coughs> at the end so on, on the Z2. Why do you always consider T squared flux rather than T flux? I want to see the composition rule. I want to see two, how two time also flux compose to a trivial. So this, this composition rule which is changed by the Z2 flux? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, basically because it's a it's a periodic boundary condition, so when you uh, annihilate them, so actually something has to go through this thing, and uh, that's where the minus one comes up. So this is very similar if we compare to a very simple case, a 2D Z2 SPT order. So we know that with just Z2 symmetry, there's a non-trivial SPT order in 2D, and what happens is that the Z2 flux if it ever, if the flux line ever ends up anywhere, it, it's, it's something like the Z2 flux carries half the Z2 charge. So if you measure the Z2 symmetry twice, you should get a minus one. And this is exactly what we see if we uh, do something like this. We insert a Z2 flux in this direction, and we insert two Z2 flux in uh, the, the horizontal direction, and we annihilate them, and we see a minus one. So that means the Z2 flux carry half the Z2 charge. Um, so the, the last example that we did is to gauge the Z2 symmetry. So 
so previously we, we talked about symmetry protected topological phases, which are short ranging tangle, but here we can gauge the Z2 symmetry and have a Z2 gauge theory with time also symmetry, and we can um, do the same process and see uh, what happens. So here, instead of uh, symmetry fluxes, we can insert gauge fluxes, and uh, this will be a, a gauge twist line. And uh, for, for time also symmetry, is still a symmetry, and we insert these uh, operators corresponding to the symmetry transformations, and still we get a minus one. Okay, so to summarize, I'm almost on my time, but uh, what we did is to um, define a local action of time also symmetry in terms of tensor network states, and um, propose how to add a symmetry twist into the state by inserting operators into the inner indices of the representation and finally use the projective composition rules of this symmetry twist um, to probe the topological order. So, um, so there are many. Uh, so this is a this is a very first step maybe in gauging time also symmetry. If the the concept, the, I imagine the concept should be more general. For, uh, first of all, we want to um, we want this process to be a generic tool for detecting time reversal related topological order. For example, uh, what we haven't been able to do is to see how this works out in three-dimensional symmetry protected topological phases. It turns out there's something in 3D with time reversal symmetry, there's something very non-trivial going on. And, uh, and so that's the next step. And uh, furthermore, for example, with these topological insulators and civil conductors, whether it makes sense to, uh, whether we can do similar things of inserting a time also flux and, um, and see something instead of inserting a U U1 flux. And also I want to see, I hope that this process of gauging time also can be defined in a more general context like already mentioned in the talk, for example, uh, in terms of Hamiltonian. So, so this, uh, with the matrix product state, we, we, or tensor product state, we can define it in terms of wave function, but if I want to define it in terms of Hamiltonian, I need a good criteria to say, what is a good way to do that? What is a meaningful way? What, uh, independent of all the gauge, independent of all the things that I don't care about, but still give me uh, invariant and meaningful answers. So that's something we're looking for. And also for gapless system, because <clears throat> for gapless system, uh, whether this inserting in inner operators uh, operators onto inner indices still works, I'm not sure. Um, well, basically, if we know how to do, do it for Hamiltonian, we know how to do it with, to gapless system, but because Hamilton, Hamiltonian doesn't care about whether it's gap or gapless, but I don't know whether that's a fundamental difference, why I can only do it for wave function. And thirdly, if this works in a space-time formulation, that will be more interesting because uh, because if I have a time direction, I'm actually reversing the time direction and uh, taking a point t and a minus t and uh, um, put them together. And finally, if, if there is a dynamical theory for time also gauge field. So for now, all we are doing is to use a non-dynamical configuration for something we, may, we might call time also gauge field, just like a, a fixed flux configuration. But for U1 gauge theory, we know there's a dynamical gauge theory of uh, many other uh, unitary sim uh, symmetries, unitary groups. We can define a dynamical gauge theory. So whether this exists for, for the time also gauge field, that I don't know. OK, thank you. Do you want to say more about the three-dimensional? <laughs> uh, uh, okay. So uh, I imagine you can you can insert the flux in different direction. That's nothing happens. I mean. So in three dimension, um, uh, so there is one within cohomology. There is one out of cohomology. Yeah. I would imagine that uh, things would be very different for the one out of cohomology because. So the within cohomology one has, is very similar to what, what happens in 1 and 2D. Basically, you apply symmetry operation, uh, you see something happening on the edge. But the something happening on the edge is, is very simple operation. Like in 2D, it's a, a line of operators, uh, just like that. But for the beyond cohomology thing, because the, the surface state, we know something about the surface state. The surface state 
if, we, if I break time reversal symmetry, I know on one side it's the trivial state, on the other side it's the EA state. So it's, it's like saying that time reversal symmetry on the boundary will be mapping between a trivial state and an EA state, which has different chirality even. And, um, and that requires a very big quantum circuit to do that. You cannot do that with a one layer of unitary symmetry or even finite layers of them. So the picture will be very different if, if I can write down a tensor network representation of the beyond cohomology uh, uh, SPT. I don't even <laughs> I don't even know how it would look like. I act time was so symmetry oh, and so 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 there's a uh, yeah. Uh, so it's so this picture. Cohomology. There's an issue about whether there is a tensor network representation. Uh, I think there is, but um, it's this picture that breaks down. It's not just simple operators like that where. You, you put them together and they cancel each other, it's still on the boundary. It's, it, on the boundary, it grows. It's something very complicated. We can, we have exactly solvable models, but it's, um, I don't know. The short answer is I don't know. Yeah. Yes. So, so did you try to lift this to the physical level and what kind of operator do you get then? Because, or is it something very ugly that you get? So you can, you can uh, of course, put that virtual yes. thing on the physical level, and that, yes. that's a transformation that you have to do on the Hamiltonian. But uh, yes, but but uh, what, what is that? Oh, is that a unit? You, you can you can for particular um, cases, if you have a fixed tensor representation, you can extract the unitaries like that. Like for but, the KLT, what would it give? Yeah, it would be some uh, sigma y or something. But the point is that you change the gauge, you change the gauging of the MPS, and the unitary changes. And uh, I, no, I haven't so made sense of uh, the corresponding operator on the Hamiltonian yet. No, but that's an operator. You act with yes. something on the virtual level that yes. is equivalent to acting on the phys on a few sides of yes. the physical level that is uh, related to correlation. Yes, yes. And, and that operator is not as simple as simple. I think no, 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 the operator is a simple operator. For example, you just imagine a bunch of singlets. And you're twisting a boundary condition, so you're just acting on one of the spin one half. And uh, the, uh, the operator is a well-defined operator for each MPS representation you choose. But you change the gauge, the corresponding operator changes. And that's a class of operator, and I haven't made sense of that class of operator yet. What, what's the criteria for setting that class of operators, saying that yes. that's the action that I should do to my Hamiltonian to gauge time also symmetry? So that's the question. Makes sense. Uh, if it's a unitary, then it's okay. It's, it, yeah, it is. It is. It's, it's mapping between wave functions. So. Alright, any other questions? Alright, let's thank Xi again.